All right, so in this lecture, we're going to talk more about the type system in Julia. We've already looked at this from when we talked about functions uh, a little bit, but we're going to go into more detail in this lecture. So first thing is we know that Julia is dynamically typed so that we don't have to, you know, we're not forced to um, define the type of any variable. It's inferred when you execute. So in this case, I'm just assigning uh, the number 100. And, and because I don't use uh, a decimal place or anything, it just assumes that this 100 uh, by default is an int 64. And I can use this type of function to uh, verify that. Right? So um, for example, if I were to change this to 100.0, then the default would be of uh, float 64 right? uh, value. We can specify the types uh, at variable declaration if we choose to, but only within the scope of a function, right? Because in Julia, it's functions that are compiled. And so, you know, it's at compilation time that this would be basically um, forced to be to be an 8-bit integer, right? So in this case, if I have a function that just simply assigns uh, an 8-bit integer uh, to the variable x and the value is 100, and then just returns the value x, well, then I can run the function. And, uh, you know, this function will be compiled uh, at the uh, run, at the first run of the function. So then that's uh, the value of the function is returned, assigned to x, and then we look at the type of x, and you can verify that it is, in fact, of int 8. Um, so we're going to look at a type tree for a particular type, uh, this number type is actually what we would call an abstract type. So if we look down underneath it, uh, you know, there's different types of numbers, there's complex and reals, and then within reals, there's uh, floats and integers, of course, and uh, you know, the different types of floats, there's 62, 32-bit, 30, 30, 30, 64-bit, 16-bit, same, you know, integers. So this is just a hierarchy of uh, the types, and we'll talk a little bit more about what these abstract types and how they're how they're useful here in a second. Um, just to give you another example, we can say look at a, what an abstract array is, um, and look at its different types. So later on, we're going to look at what uh, you know arrays are. They're a subtype of a dense array, which is a subtype of this uh, abstract array. And again, we're going to talk more about what these abstract types are uh, here in just a second. Um, I'll refer you to the Julia documentation to basically uh, get an idea of all the different types that are available. So we already, again, looked at um, types within re with respect to function arguments, but let's take a little deeper dive here and see exactly what's going on. So if we define a function that takes two arguments, x and y, and just returns the product of those two, so the function's name is g in this case, when we first call the function, which happens here on line five, Julia understands that, you know, like we said before, this two without a decimal place is by default an int 64, uh, as is three. So basically it, it notices the types uh, are of int, the two arguments are of both of int 64, and it compiles a version of this function associated with that. And, and then you can see, of course, then if we multiply two int 64s together, we also have an int 64. And so uh, that's, what ha that's what's returned from this function. And you can see the value, of course, is six, right? So two times three is six. And the type of the variable uh, six is of int 64, right? Likewise, the default for uh, if we just use a decimal place, so 2.0 is a float 64 as well as 3.0 uh, float 64. And if I multiply those together, I also get float 64. Right? So when this function is called, this function is compiled by Julia into um, uh, a function that has two arguments of both type float and float 64, and then they're multiplied together, returning 6.0, of course. Works for strings also, uh, only because the the product operator uh, has been overloaded in Julia to basically be a string concatenation tool. 
So if I pass in two strings, foo and bar, then multiplying them together concatenates them. And you, again, you see this um, returning is, is you know, the answer foo bar plus the type of what X is now is a string, right? However, you know, it doesn't really, you know, perhaps we don't want um, our function to operate on strings because it's, you know, it's a little bit ill-defined of what the multiplication of two strings is. So what we can do is we can actually restrict our function, in this case, via this abstract type number, to be only the multiplication of numbers, right? So now we have a new function f, where it takes, again, two arguments, but now we've restricted those arguments to be of type number, which, again, if we go back and look at that type tree, would be any of those things, right? So complex numbers, real numbers, uh, the integers, and floating points of all the various sizes, right? So... Um, well, I just noticed here, this should be calling the function f. Let me replace that. Uh, yeah. So there. So if we, if we put in two, um, two integers here, right? In this case, again, this is by default and it's 64. So that, you know, two times three and 64 return six of type in 64. So everything looks good there. However, with our new function f, if we tried to pass in two strings, right, uh, foo and bar, now we get an error because, uh, you know, it tells us there's no method matching uh, f that is takes two arguments of type string. And again, that's because we've restricted the type here. Right? can also have type unions. So we can, uh, you know, basically if we wanted our arguments X and Y to be of integer or string, but exclude floating point numbers, for example, I don't know why you'd want to do that, but if that's something you'd want to do, then you can have this kind of notation here. So you have a, a union of integer and string, and you can actually assign this to a new type. You could give this a name if you wanted, but, but here we're just doing it in the argument list. Um, and, and so then you can see it works, right? So uh, H, if I pass in two integers, works, it returns a number. If I pass in two strings, it returns the concatenation of those strings. However, if I pass in two floating point numbers as arguments, again, I get an error because, uh, you know, there's no function H that has, that it matches uh, float 64, right? It's been restricted to only integers and strings via this union here. We can also create composite types. So in this case, we're going to create a new type uh, called point 2D. The keyword to create a new type is called struct. Uh, that's similar to the C language, if you're familiar with that, or C++. And so in this case, our composite type is going to be, you know, we call it a composite type because it's a combination of multiple fields. And in this case, the fields are X and Y, and we're going to assign them, you know, um, to be float 64s. So uh, when we instantiate this type, passing in two numbers, one and two, uh, those numbers by default get assigned in order to the fields as they're listed here, right? So one goes to X and two goes to Y. And then we can access those fields uh, by this notation here. So it's similar to an object-oriented notation like you'd see in Python or C++. So the field X of, of the point P, which we've instantiated here, uh, has the value 1, and the field Y of the, of the point P uh, has the value 2. However, you know, in this case, we've hard-coded X and Y to be float 64s, but we might want something more generic. We, we, we might want, in another different scenario, for these to be integers only, right? And of course, we could create another composite type with a different name, say, you know, point 2D real for, for floating, or, you know, float, point 2D float for floating point number, or point 2D int for integers. Uh, but we can do something more sophisticated here and, and uh, more general, and that is using parametric types, right? So in this case, the notation we use is, is this. Uh, I have a 3D point um, where, I'm going to have this parametric type t, and and I want you to understand that t is just a it's just a dummy variable here. It could be, you could use any other letter or any other name for that matter. It's just basically what it's saying is that whatever whatever when we instantiate this um, type, whatever we put in here 
is going to be assigned to all three of these variables. And so here's an example of that, right? No, I'm sorry, all three of these fields. So here's an example of that. Again, by default, um, the arguments one, two, and three will be assigned to X, Y, and Z respectively. But this time, um, I'm specifying that I want the fields to be of type int eight. And so of course, uh, once we instantiate it and assign it to a variable P, this is a 3D point or point 3D rather, uh, P where the fields will be of type int eight. And again, we can uh, look at the fields via this notation P dot X, which shows that the X field has a value one. And if we look at the type of any of the fields, in this case, I'm looking at Y, P dot Y, uh, we can see it is in fact int eight as we have instantiated it, right? And we could do this for for any any other type of instantiation, right? So we can instantiate it as float thirty twos and look at the type of one of the fields, and in fact they are point thirty two uh, float thirty twos, uh, as well as even strings, right? So this works for all of them. So this is called a a parametric composite type. Um, we can put type restrictions on those parameters using this type, type of notation here. So here what we're saying is we're going to have a numeric point 2D, right? So again, we want to restrict, you know, it kind of doesn't make sense to have points that have number fields if we're talking about a point in space. I'm sorry. It doesn't make sense to have points that are string fields if we're talking about a point in space. And so uh, in this case, what we're going to do is we're going to restrict uh, the, the, the types of the fields to things that fall into the category of real numbers, right? And we could go back and look at our uh, tree if we wanted to see what the real numbers are, but basically it's floats and integers, uh, both unsigned and signed integers. Uh, by the way, unsigned integers mean that, that there's no there's no sign to them. It's not a positive or negative number, it's just uh, the number of one, two, uh, integer number. So in this case, we're restricting uh, our type via this notation here to only real numbers. And again, uh, this so this numeric point, we can instantiate it and assign it to a variable P and look at the type of the field. And you see it in fact works, uh, whether I instantiate it as a float 64 or as an int eight, uh, they both work. Uh, but if I try to instantiate it as a string, which again, because a string is not of a subtype of real, right? Uh, then, then it doesn't work, right? So it even gives us some uh, idea of why, right? So numeric point 2D and T, it expected T to be uh, a subtype of real and it got a type of string, right? So this is, this is not gonna work. Um, we can also have functions and operators with parametric types. So in this case, I'm, I'm overloading the plus operator. Basically, I wanna define a function th that I can add two points together, right? And and so in this case, it's gonna the plus operator, the 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 func the argument on the left hand side of the plus operator will be of type numeric point that is parametric, and also the one on the right will be of numeric point that is parametric, and these of course have to be the same type. So in order to add um, you know, if I want to add the fields of the of A and B together, they need to be of the same type. So here I use this notation where T, and this is a little confusing, but what this allows for is that this type parameter can be used in the function definition, right? So the function definition is over here. Basically, I, the, I'm defining the function uh, plus when you're adding two points together to add the fields of the points together, right? So the X values will be added together and the Y values will be added together. And they will both be of type T uh, that, that is in, in, you know, whatever whatever it is when you, whatever the type T is of A and B. So I think this is best illustrated with an example here, right? So I'm gonna instantiate both two points, A and B. Um, they'll actually be the same point in space. So X value is one, Y value is two. Uh, and they'll both be of type int 32. So then if I add them together, right, uh, because I've defined this plus operation to operate on these types, then the result is another uh, point 2D of type int 32, just like A and B, uh, of course, but the fields have been added together, right? So one plus one is two and two plus two is four. 
I uh, just want to point out here that the fields of composite types are immutable by default. Immutable means they, they can't be changed, right? So if I try to reassign the value of A, uh, the X field of A, if I try to reassign it, then I'm going to get an error, right? And it even tells me why, like uh, immutable struct of type, so, uh, of type numeric 2D cannot be changed, right? So the struct, uh, the struct keyword is, is immutable by default, right? We can't have... We can create mutable structs as well, or you know, mutable composite types. And, and so here, to do that, we have to use the word mutable in front of it. Uh, again, this is just like uh, the one from before, where we're restricting the types to real numbers, have two fields. Uh, but in this case, I can instantiate the, the uh, mutable point 2D, assign it to a variable A, and then I can reassign one of the fields, right? So I can say A dot X equals two. And then if I print out what that is now, you'll see it's two where it was originally one upon class instantiation. So there's, uh, you know, several operators uh, or op operations that we can do on types. Uh, I'm going to list a few here. Uh, so for example, this is a test, right? So, I, you know, is one an int? By the way, the keyword int is just shorthand for int64. That's the default value, right? So one, again, we know uh, integers are, are by default in 64 bit integers, uh, and, and int is a keyword for a 64 bit integer as well. And so, there, uh, if you know, we're basically comparing this, right? Is, is one an int? Yes, it is. Okay, so we get true there. Um, we've already seen this, uh, just listing it here again. We can check the type of any, any, any variable uh, or a number, right? And so, uh, any object, I should say. So in this case, the type of one, again, is an int64. Um, we can also check the super type, right? So if we if we look at what, you know, what, what is the super type of an int32? Well, it's assigned, right? And that means signed integer, right? Uh, there, there's also, you know, say, uh, I could look at uh, the uint32. That's an unsigned 32-bit integer. And if I run that, then, then I get the, the super type or abstract type there is, is unsigned, right? So we can have constructors that are different. So by constructors, we mean, you know, what does the function look like when you instantiate a type? By default, I already mentioned that uh, the default constructor for any, any composite type uh, is just the name of the type along with um, the fields, right? And so um, in this case, uh, the the type itself is also inferred by the field. So since I used 1.0, I automatically get a 64-bit a, a floating point number uh, for the type T, and and uh, those are those are uh, illustrated here. So for example, if I instantiate the field like this, then you know where I have um, say R is like a radius and theta is you know the angle and radians in polar coordinates. Um, and then if I look at the angle, then, then I get this uh, for, for pi over 4, okay? So again, the default is just to uh, take the arguments of the type and assign them to the fields in order, okay? But let's say we wanted to have some other type of constructor for a type. We can do that through a function. And what we do is we use the same name as the type, right? So our, our type is polar. Here we have a function polar. And in this case, our function is going to accept an argument that is going to be a point, right? So in fact, specifically, it's going to be our numeric point 2D, again, where we have a generic parameterized type T. I use this notation where T to make T available in the function body. And so uh, what I can do here is then convert the fields of the numeric point, right? So the fields of the numeric point are X and Y. I can convert them into a radius by uh, computing the magnitude, uh, and I can also convert them into an angle by computing the arctangent uh, there. And then, so then I have R and theta, and I can pass those in along with the parameterized type. I can pass those in to polar, which is defined up here using the default constructor, right? And so with this, I can then start with my numeric point 2D, right? And, uh, you know, where my X and Y values are uh, just the sine and cosine of pi over four. 
And so now I have this type A, this variable A is of type numeric point 2D, and I can pass that into Polar, and because it uses multiple dispatch, in other words, it's matching types, right? A is of type numeric point 2D, so it automatically calls this version of the function, which has an argument of type numeric point 2D, and then computes the fields for the regular Polar type and passes it, them along, right? So now I have, you know, B is a, a, a Polar type, and if I look at the fields uh, for B, R and theta, they've been computed via this function. And you can see that, you know, R is, is effectively one and, and B is, is uh, again, uh, rounded off, but it's it's the pi over four, right? It's the angle in, in, in radians. And in, in this case, I also restricted the type to be a float 32, right? And so that's why you see these are these are 32 bit floating point numbers. And if we print out the type uh, of that, then, then you can see that as well.